Welcome to the Ig Nobel Prize Ceremony. This year's theme is chemistry. Here's a quick chemistry lesson. Iron can combine with oxygen to produce steel, shown here in the form of a sharp bladed sword. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, magnesium, and several other elements can combine to form a human being, shown here in the form of a sword swallower. Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine for a research paper I co-wrote that was published in the British Medical Journal entitled Sword Swallowing and Its Side Effects. <laughs> and now for a demonstration, hopefully without any side effects. swallowers <laughs> when necessary and this is my musical colleague Nobel laureate Rich Roberts Rich. <laughs> Rich and I would like to present for you from memory the entirety of our favorite chemistry textbook it's called the Elements by Tom Lehrer. <laughs> There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, and erysium, methenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, tethium, vanadium, lanthanum, and osmium, and astine, and radium, and gold, and actinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, and terbium, and actinium, and rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, and niobium, and rhythm, and strontium, and seracon, and cerium, and samarium, and prism, and erythium, and beryllium, and barium. There's chromium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorium and tritium and manganese and mercury and molybdenum and magnesium and dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead plesiodymium and platinum plutonium palladium promethium and potassium polonium tantalum decesium titanium tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and deuterium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also in aluminium, and cyanium, and nobelium, and argon, and tinium, and xenon, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to harbor. But I'm from Sheffield University, and we know there are at least another dozen that have been discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and chemists, welcome to the 21st first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. You see here on stage the Nobel laureates, the past Ig Nobel Prize winners, 24-7 lecturers and other ignitaries. Now please welcome our most special guests, the new Ig Nobel Prize winners.
I'm Karen Hopkin, creator of the Stud Muffins of Science calendar. I, I am also the creator of the bundle of chemicals known as Christopher. We're gathered here tonight at Sanders Theater at Harvard University. We begin with the grand introductions of the audience delegations, led by the high panjandrum of delegations, Louise Sacco. As we introduce each delegation, it will make its presence known by standing up and twirling in place three times counterclockwise. Please greet them all with the respect they deserve. Let's begin the introductions. Marching tonight, we have the Texans for the Advancement of Universal Sexual Chemistry, one lab, one love, let's get together and breed all night. The Harvard Society of Physics Students. Epsilon Sigma Pi, MIT's premier chemistry kitchen society. And marching, we have the Museum of Bad Art bringing the worst of art to the widest of audiences, now on Facebook. We have Mensa, the organization for people with abnormal scores on certain standardized psychological tests. The North Shore Sigma Xi, Marie and the Elements the Harvard Computer Society, MIT's Mazzy Hall, and marching the McLean Neuroimaging Center with first-hand knowledge of better living through neurochemistry. The Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association. New Hampshire's... New Hampshire's Hollis Brookline High School first robotics team. MIT's Knight Fellows, the science journalist whose chemical formula includes both ignorance and bravery. And finally, marching tonight, we have the lawyers for and against chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, literati, glitterati, pseudo-intellectuals, quasi-pseudo-intellectuals, and stereoisomers, may I introduce our master of ceremonies, the editor of the Annals of Improbable Research, Chief Airhead, Mark Abrams. Good evening. We are gathered here tonight to honor some remarkable individuals and groups. Every winner has done something that makes people laugh and then think. The Ig Nobel Ceremony is produced by the Science Humor Magazine, the Annals of Improbable Research, and co-sponsored by the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, the Harvard Radcliffe Society of Physics Students, and by the Harvard Computer Society. Tonight, 10 prizes will be given. The achievements speak for themselves all too eloquently. <laughs> the editors of the Annals of Improbable Research have chosen a theme for this year's ceremony, and that theme is chemistry. <laughs> Let me introduce a few of the several hundred people who are here on our stage. First, the Nobel laureates, a 1986 Nobel laureate in chemistry, Dudley Hirschbach. A 1993 Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, Rich Roberts. A 2007 Nobel laureate in economics, Eric Maskin. Uh, 2010 Nobel Laureate in Economics, Peter Diamond. Uh, 
1998 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, Lou Ignaro. A 2005 Nobel Laureate in Physics, a man who for more than a decade has humbly swept paper airplanes from the stage at this ceremony, Roy Glauber. Uh, 1990 Nobel Laureate in Physics from MIT, Jerome Friedman. As usual, was prevented from joining us. Uh, he appears now via the magic of videotape. Congratulations. I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Friedman. Now, let us quickly meet some of the other authority figures who are on our stage. The band, Nick Karstoyu and himself. The human spotlights. The human curtain rods. Back there somewhere. The official keepers of the mop who will sweep detritus from our stage. Sylvia Rosenberg. Isabel Rosenberg, and Roy Glauber, who will do some sweeping. Will Roy Glauber do some sweeping, as he always does. That's okay. For uh, those worried about sex and violence, our V-chip monitor will attempt to block anything offensive from reaching your ears, eyes, or fingertips. Here is our V-chip monitor, noted New York attorney, William J. Maloney. <laughs> Mr. Maloney, Mr. Maloney, will you please demonstrate your displeasure? Thank you. As you know, we used to have a problem at this ceremony. Many of the speakers would exceed their allotted time. Here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, delightful, ever so cute, Miss Sweetie Poo. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Poo, Miss Sweetie Poo is eight years old. Miss Sweetie Poo, will you please demonstrate what you will do when someone has exceeded their allotted time? Please stop! I'm bored! Please stop! I'm bored! Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Please stop! Now, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Now, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. There are other important people up here. You'll meet them a bit later. We want to say a special hello to the live Ig Nobel parties in Philadelphia and London and many other places. We are being webcast live. There really are. We are being webcast live thanks to generous support from the Harvard Extension School and from Google. And we also want to thank for generous support Microsoft Research and the Museum of Science Boston and Looped Logic. Optimal Systems Laboratory, Red Bones, and all of our other generous supporters. Thank you very much. Uh, complete video of tonight's ceremony will be posted soon on the website at improbable.com. A uh, special version will be broadcast later in the year on National Public Radio on Talk of the Nation Science Friday with Ira Flato. <laughs> And now, Professor Jean Burko Gleason will deliver the traditional Ig Nobel welcome, welcome speech.
Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Now, let's get it over with, ladies and gentlemen, the awarding of the 2011 Ig Nobel Prizes. We are giving out 10 prizes. The winners come from many nations. This year's winners have truly earned their prizes. Karen, would you tell them what they've won? Thank you. Each year's winner will receive an Ig Nobel Prize. And uh, what else? Um, oh, uh... A piece of paper saying they've won an Ig Nobel Prize. Are there any distinguishing marks? Uh, oh, uh, it's signed by several Nobel laureates, and it's ah, it's made of chemicals. Ah, great, genuine chemicals. Oh yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Karen. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is the coveted Ig Nobel Prize. It's a periodic table table. <laughs> this, was, this was invented by Theo Gray, uh, and Theo Gray received the Ig Nobel Prize in chemistry for inventing the periodic table table. And now our winners. First, the Physiology Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Physiology is presented to Anna Wilkinson of the UK, Natalie Sabans of the Netherlands, Hungary, and Austria, Isabella Mandel of Austria, and Ludwig Huber of Austria for their study, No Evidence of Contagious Yawning in the red-footed tortoise. <laughs> and here is Ludwig Huber. So many, many thanks to you for your patience and for your laughing. Uh, it is really a funny story, and this is Anna Wilkinson. All the credits go to her. She is the mastermind behind the cold-blooded cognition lab in Vienna. So we are testing reptiles like tortoise, whether they uh, engage in social learning, in any kind of social behavior. So for instance, we found that they learn socially, although they are completely solitary species, and also they follow the gaze of each other but they do not yawn contagiously. That means they do not behave in the way we behave if we uh, empathize, if we uh, share interests and do other things. So this is really a story about the evolution of cognition. I thank Anna, I thank Isabella, I thank Natalie Sebans, and also Wilhelmina and all the tortoise. Thank you. The Chemistry Prize. The Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize is awarded this year to Makoto Imai, Naoki Urushihata, Hideki Tanamura, uh, Yukinoba Tajima, Hideki Gato, Koichiro Mitsoguchi, and Junichi Murakami of Japan for determining the ideal density of airborne wasabi, pungent horseradish, <laughs> to awaken sleeping people in case of a fire or other emergency, and requiring this knowledge to invent the wasabi alarm. Here is everyone.
We have been thinking about how to wake up people with hearing disabilities in case of emergency. The answer is wasabi spray. <laughs> the optimal concentration of air, airy wasabi is from 5 to 20 ppm. By the way, this prize is a gift from the subject who slept in the examination room and had been choked with pungent smell, with the tears and cough. <laughs> I do appreciate their courage and cooperation. <laughs> Our next mission is to maximize the potential of wasabi spray. <laughs> For example, to reduce uncomfortable smell of shoes. <laughs> but. Do not spray onto sushi <laughs> and Japanese noodles. Thank you. And now we have a demonstration. Wasabi nice to wake up. Wasabi nice and to find. Now a very special musical event. You are familiar with Tom Lehrer's classic song, The Elements. He also made an alternate version. It has been performed only once in public, and that was long ago in a place where there were very few people to see it. Tiny audience. Tonight, here, now, is the modern premiere of The Elements by Aristotle, translated by Tom Lehrer. It will be performed by mezzo-soprano Roberta Gilbert and pianist Brandon Grimmett. Give your attention to Nobel laureate Lou Ignaro. Please join me in a moment of science.
your V-chip monitor. Please listen carefully to the following uh, safety and recycling announcement. It is almost, and I emphasize almost, time for the throwing of the paper airplanes. Remember what's important, safety, accuracy, recycling, safety, and uh, chemistry. Now, for those of you who are proficient in the art of throwing paper airplanes, please aim at the human aerodrome. Don't, don't throw at the people up here. Don't throw at me. Aim at the human aerodrome. Uh, it's right there. And for the rest of you, please at least try to aim at the human aerodrome. Now, uh, get ready to hurl. On your marks. Get set. Throw. Well, the uh, safety was okay. The accuracy was not optimal. However, maybe you'll do better on the second round. Thank you. And now, here's a musical treat. The world premiere of a new mini-opera called Chemist in a Coffee Shop. There are five acts, one now, three later, and one after that. It stars Maria Ferrante, Roberta Gilbert, Thomas Michel, Daniel Rosenberg, and Mark Andelman, with pianist Brandon Grimmett, and it's directed by David Stockton. Now here is our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Thank you, Cupcake. Tonight's opera is about a coffee shop. It's also about chemistry. The shop has two baristas who are really knowledgeable about coffee. Oh, looks like they uh, have a new customer. Looks like that customer is, uh, is a chemist. <laughs> looks like the baristas are giving him a nice, fresh cup of coffee. Looks like it's time for me to shut up and see what happens. It tastes like coffee. <laughs> That's because it is coffee. <laughs> you may work in a coffee shop, but I'll bet you don't know what's in coffee, chemically speaking. Coffee is not what you think. Coffee is a very simple drink mostly good old h two o hydrogen and oxygen that's water don't you know <laughs> <laughs> And hardly any care. <laughs> Put some water into a cup. Coffee too. Then just stir it up. Lots of sugar, lots of cream. Simply put the more you add, the better it will seem. <laughs> Beans might matter in mine, or rather please. My bean preference, well, just a little the anise. But rub 
Medicine Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine is awarded this year to Miriam Tuck of the Netherlands and the UK, Deborah Trampa of the Netherlands and Luke Warlop of Belgium, and jointly to Matthew Lewis, Peter Snyder, and Robert Felvin of the USA, and to Robert Pietrzak, David Darby, and Paul Maruff of Australia for demonstrating that people make better decisions about some kinds of things, but worse decisions about other kinds of things when they have a strong urge to urinate. Please welcome Miriam Tuck, Luke Vorloff, and Peter Snyder, Robert Feldman, and David Darby. Each group will give its own speech. In our research, we examined whether a physiological form of control, bladder control, uh, can also facilitate behavioral control. We had several participants uh, who had to drink either a lot or just a little bit of water, and approximately one half an hour later, they engaged in several tasks. It turned out that those who had to control their bladder to a larger extent were better able at controlling their automatic impulses, and they were more patient with money, so they could wait for a later but larger reward instead of wanting a more immediate reward. 
This suggests that uh, neurological control signals are task unspecific, which has important implications for impulse control. Thank you. Well, thank you on behalf of all scientists who work tirelessly each and every day to understand the complex relationship between main, man's brain and his urologic system. We've, our results are a little bit different from what you just heard because we caused some serious pain in our study. The brain's control of bladder is complex. We can delay voiding as long as we choose to a point. As we know, the longer we wait, the more pain that we feel. Using sensitive cognitive tests that we designed ourselves, we found that increasing cognitive impairment in attention and working memory with delayed voiding. These impairments were the same, actually, as staying awake for 24 hours or if you reach the legal limit for driving at a bar. Also, these deficits magically go away as soon as you uh, run to the bathroom. Why this relationship between thinking and peeing? Ah. When you gotta go? You gotta go. <laughs> We're honored to have with us tonight some Ig Nobel Prize winners from previous years. You've already met sword swallower Dan Meyer. Dan, wanna please stand up and uh, take a quick bow? You may have noticed a while back that Dudley Hirschbach is wearing an unusual business suit. Dudley, could you stand up? And, and that I am wearing an unusual business suit. And uh, if you're near the stage, uh, you may have noticed that these suits smell quite wonderful. And it's not just Dudley, it's not just me, it's the suits. Okay. The 1999 Ig Nobel Prize in Environmental Protection was awarded to the inventor of the self-perfuming business suit. Please welcome from the Colon Company in Korea, Hyuk Ho Kwan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really moved uh, to come back to this ceremony again. Uh, when I received the Egon Nobel Prize uh, uh, with the self-perfuming uh, self business suit back in 1999, I said, uh, just as I expected my lifetime to be fragrant, I hope every one of you may have the fragrance in your life. But in 12 years, I find that only my suit, only my suit still has good smell. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, new uh, product, uh, which is uh, designed to save lives, to save lives, uh, sa uh, save lives from the dangers of nature, uh, such as an um, uh, accident in mountains. Uh, so I hope this jacket could save your life and uh, the fragrance in your life could save your soul. Thank you. <laughs> the 2009 Ig Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for testing whether Coca-Cola is an effective spermicide. Please welcome the scientist who did it, Dr. Deborah Anderson. Classic Coke kills sperm within one second. Diet Coke is equally effective. The new Coke and Cherry Coke are not effective. Be careful when you use Coca-Cola as a contraceptive. <laughs> the 
the 1996 Ig Nobel Prize in Art was awarded to the creator of the plastic pink flamingo. Please welcome back Don Featherstone and his wife, Nancy Featherstone. Did you ever think what this world would be like without chemistry? You wouldn't have some of the beautiful things that we have today, like the pink plastic lawn flamingo. <laughs> it's time for act two of the mini opera, Chemist in a Coffee Shop. Here is our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Mm, thank you, my uh, cadmium crusted cream puff. In act two of our opera, we're still in the coffee shop. Of course we are. Why would we go anywhere else? Oh, the two baristas uh, look like they want to talk about coffee. <laughs> Nothing new there. Let's see what they have to say. Caffeine, caffeine, trimethyl 
Xanthine, yes, pedantically, it's the same. and makes you leap. But in Japan, though, this dreamy drink is what they use to put themselves to sleep. In a little neighborhood coffee shop, we do the coffee for its white dilute. But Turks and Greeks serve it thick as slop. And if they don't, there'll be a great dispute. Kidney 
The Psychology Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Psychology is awarded to Carl Halvor Teigen of the University of Oslo, Norway, for trying to understand why, in daily life, people sigh. Please welcome Carl Halvor Teigen. Well, this study is the result of a research project with psychology students. I wanted to show that there are still topics in psychology that have been overlooked by research. <laughs> size is one such topic. We found no empirical studies of size, so we had to invent our own psychology. <laughs> We asked people what it meant when other people sighed, and they thought they were simply sad. But when they sighed themselves, it simply meant a resignation, I give up. <laughs> so we gave people puzzles they could not solve, and they gave up, <laughs> and they sighed. <laughs> <clears throat> Others have claimed different results. Physiologically, sighing serves to normalize irregular breathing during stress. But we also think... When you are bored, you should sigh. <laughs> the 24-7 lectures are about to begin. The first 24-7 lecture, well, I should explain what they are, shouldn't I? 24-7 right. lectures are for several speakers. They are the world's top thinkers. They're invited here to tell us very briefly what they are thinking about. Each 24-7 lecturer will explain his or her subject twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. And then, after a brief pause, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. The 24-second time limit will be enforced by our referee, Mr. John Barrett. Mr. Barrett... <laughs> Mr. Barrett, do you have any advice for our 24-7 lecturers? Gentlemen, keep it clean. <laughs> okay. And now... The first 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a pioneer in the study of protein folding, a professor of biology at MIT, a member of the Whitehead Institute, Susan Lindquist. Her topic, stress responses. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Brief sublethal exposures to diverse proteotoxic stresses induces a highly orchestrated cellular response that counteracts apoptotic and necrotic cell death pathways through the deployment of molecular osmolites, protein folding reagents, remodeling factors, and deubiquitating and ubiquitating ligases. <laughs> and now, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set. Go. What doesn't kill you makes you strong. <laughs> the next 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a professor of chemistry at Oklahoma University, a visiting professor at MIT, a science advisor to the television program Breaking Bad, Donna Nelson. Her topic single-walled carbon nanotubes. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. We analyzed functionalized single-walled carbon nanotubes by using uh, NMR. Initially, we found that the uh, analyses were not reproducible. The, they seemed to depend upon how long the samples set before analysis. We thought the nanotubes might be rebundling, 
so we tried sonicating the samples just before taking the NMR. That produced consistent results. And now, a clear summary <laughs> that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Nanotube analyses should be shaken, not stored. <laughs> the next 24-7 lecture will be delivered by a professor of chemistry at Harvard, 1986 Nobel laureate in chemistry, Dudley Hirschbach. His topic, chemistry. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. On your mark. Preamble, preamble. Look at page three of your program. You'll find, oh no. That's what my talk is about, a reaction that produces, oh no. First, a complete technical <laughs> description in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Laser-induced fluorescent spectra have been obtained for OH radicals produced when hydrogen atoms and NO2 react in thermal energy collisions in the region where the two beams intersect the reagents intersect. Spectra of the 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, and 1, 3 bands of the A doublet sigma to X doublet pi system have been observed. Distributions of OH over the whole energetically accessible range of row vibrational levels have been determined using surprisal analysis. And now a oh, no. clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Molecules are seldom vicious, although often capricious. <laughs> the final 24-7 lecture will be delivered by an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois, author of the blog, Context and Variation, Kate Clancy. Her topic, vaginal pH. First, a complete technical summary in 24 words. On your mark, get set, go. The pH of a healthy premenopausal vagina is 3.8 to 4.5. This means that your vag is more acidic than skin, water, and semen, which is 7.2 to 7.8. The vagina will even produce more acid in the presence of semen in order to regulate pH. When vaginal pH is more basic, you are susceptible to bacterial infections. Douching makes it more basic and flushes out your normal vaginal flora more extensively and forcefully than ejaculate. Then the fragrance irritates vaginal tissue. So those ads that tell you to hail to the V with their weird talking hand vaginas, if you really want to hail to the V, let your vag be. And now, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. Leave your acidic vagina alone. Don't douche. description. Uh, would you like to hear it? Um, as long as there's no demonstration. Vaginas should smell like vaginas, not flowers. The Literature Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Literature this year is awarded to John Perry of Stanford University, USA, for his theory of structured procrastination, which says, to be a high achiever, always work on something important, using it as a way to avoid doing something that's even more important. Professor Perry was unable to be here tonight, but he sent a colleague to accept on his behalf. Please welcome Deborah Wilkes. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and academics. Uh, 
I, I'm John Perry's editor, and I have this one of my duties, right, to show up because he is a procrastinator. Uh, so he has sent me this message. He's in Germany this evening and wanted me to relay these words. Beam at audience. <laughs> I'm honored to receive this prize for my work on structured procrastination, and sorry I can't be here to celebrate with all these esteemed winners. Frankly, as a devout practitioner of structured procrastination, it was all I could do to compose this little speech. My thanks go mainly to my editor, Deborah Wilkes, <laughs> who despite my procrastination has published some of my finest works over many years. I have, in my opinion, made enormous contributions to philosophy in the course of my career, changing the way that occupants of the most widely de deserted mansion we call analytic philosophy, thanks, and certainly I get tons of email, and thank you, and blow a kiss to the audience. It's time for act three of our mini opera, Chemist in a Coffee Shop. Here's our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Mm, thank you, my molybdenous mocha latte. It's street performer day at the coffee shop. Uh, street performers get a free cup of coffee if they come to the shop and perform something about coffee. Oh, here comes one now. Mm, he's a doctor too. Uh, it's Dr. Thomas Michelle of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Michelle's been doing some research on the health effects of coffee. Maybe he'll tell us about that. Diet, though it seems a bit obscure, there's no reason not to try it. It's so simple and so pure. Coffee's good at elevating your base metabolic rate. That's your brainstem oscillating. You'll feel vibrant, you'll feel great. All you drink is coffee, 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 lunch or dinner. Coffee, 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 you get dinner. Coffee, 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 saint or sinner. Everyone drinks coffee, 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 coffee. Oh, as an appetite suppressant, coffee is incessant, yet it makes you effervescent. Coffee is just so bad, it turns into a habit. Keeps you hopping like a rabbit. And here's why it's dietetic. It's a diuretic. And it makes you go, 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 you want to sleep because you want to keep on drinking because it's sweet. Record keeping on this diet is so simple to keep up. All you do to quantify it is to count each coffee cup. Randy Benty, more than 20 cups a day. A habit makes, 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 habit, 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 habit. As an appetite suppressant, coffee is incessant, yet it makes you effervescent. Coffee is just so bad, it turns into a habit, keeps you hopping like a rabbit. And here's why it's dietetic, it's a diuretic, makes you go, 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 go. You cannot sleep because you want to keep on drinking as it's cheap. And it has no cholesterol. It has no nutrients at all. Coffee, 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 coffee. Coffee, 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 coffee. coffee.
That song was originally part of one of our earlier operas in 2004, and we could not resist using it again. If you've come to a previous Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, you almost certainly saw Professor Lipscomb, uh, William Lipscomb, the colonel. He was a Kentucky colonel. Uh, he was also a Harvard professor of chemistry, a 1976 Nobel laureate in chemistry. He was a, a clarinet player, a baseball player. He was our good friend and collaborator. Professor Lipscomb passed away this spring at the age of 91, and we miss him. Uh, we've gathered together a few snippets of video uh, that show Professor Lipscomb in some of his many guises. Excuse me, a 1976, I apologize, a 1976 Nobel laureate in chemistry from Harvard University, William Lipscomb. <laughs> Explain what you're doing, please. The first, first thing you do is get it into the car. That same time. To my dedication to Congress, if your position is everywhere, your momentum is zero. The world premiere of a slide presentation prepared by Nobel laureate William Lipscomb. It is entitled Professor Lipscomb Makes a Cup of Tea. <laughs> Winnaday Prize is William Lipscomb. Please give a warm Winnaday welcome to Nobel stud Colonel Bill Lipscomb. Scholarly study the significance of Mr. Richard Buckley's experiment. Now the final act of Ghost appears to have returned and be uh, monkeying with the projector, but uh, that was Professor Lipscomb. And uh, Bruce Petchek, who's in the back, assembled that video, and several members of Professor Lipscomb's family are here, who we're happy to say with us tonight. And now. The Biology Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Biology this year goes to Daryl Gwynn of Canada and Australia and the USA and David Rents of Australia and the USA for discovering that a certain kind of beetle mates with a certain kind of Australian beer bottle. <laughs> Please welcome Daryl Gwynn, David Rents. This is a, a study of um, sex and the brewing industry in Australia. And uh, it was some 23 years ago we did this study. And David and I have been waiting by the telephone for the phone call <laughs> for decades. And it finally came. 
It's a study of uh, Australian beetles that um, are fooled into mating with beer bottles. And I let my colleague David Rents take up the theme. Well, we were out on the Australian desert one morning and we discovered a large beetle called the Buprestid that was attempting to mate with beer bottles that had been cast along the side of the road by truck drivers and the like. And we, uh, we did a number of experiments that isolated the, the, the causes of this and it had to do with color and with the tubercles that seemed to be on the, on the bottom of the beer bottle held as grips. Well, keep talking. It has deep ecological significance for the, for the conservation of the beetles and also for sexual differences theory. <laughs> Only males make mating mistakes, not females. I am your V-chip monitor, and it's uh, almost time to start throwing the paper airplanes at the designated target. There it is. Remember what's important. Safety, accuracy, recycling, safety, and chemistry. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, please give your attention to Nobel laureate Eric Maskin. Please join us in a moment of science.
it's time for Act Four of our mini opera, Chemist in a Coffee Shop. Please welcome our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Okay, thank you, my deuterium dusted apple dumpling. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, well, we're still here in the coffee shop. Um, I'm having my fourth cup, so uh, this must be Act Four. Uh, I'm anxious to see what's going to happen, but first I have to pee. I've just had four cups of coffee. Excuse me, will you? I'll be back. Meanwhile, you listen to the music. <laughs> Sugar in my coffee with the rice. 
Physics Prize. The Ig Nobel Physics Prize is awarded this year to Philippe Perrin, Cyril Perrault, Dominique Devetern, and Bruno Ragaru of France, and Herman King Ma of the Netherlands for determining why discus throwers become dizzy and why hammer throwers don't. The winners could not journey to the ceremony. Instead, here is their acceptance speech delivered by video. On behalf of all of us, we're very happy to accept the uh, IG Nobel Prize. Um, as we understand, it's uh, something that um, deals with research that at first glance sounds very funny. And we accept it, especially because we want to show that our research is not funny at all. Uh, we are very serious researchers trying to find out how the balance system works. We do that in a sports situation, in natural situation, and especially also in patients. So one of the things that we develop is knowledge to help our patients. And one of the examples is breastfeeding implants, understanding more about diseases, and this is that we want to bring under your attention. Thank you. Complementary to this uh, field, it's also a big interest to understand motion sickness. Thank you, gentlemen. The Mathematics Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Mathematics is awarded to Dorothy Martin of the USA, who predicted the world would end in 1954, Pat Robertson of the USA, who predicted the world would end in 1982, Elizabeth Clare Prophet of the USA, who predicted the world would end in 1990, Lee Jang Rim of Korea, who predicted the world would end in 1992, Credonia Mwerinde of Uganda, who predicted the world would end in 1999, and Harold Camping of the USA, who predicted the world would end on September 6, 1994, and later predicted that the world will end on October 21st, 2011. They are being awarded this prize for teaching the world to be careful when making mathematical assumptions and calculations. The winners could not or would not be with us tonight. And now, it's time for the Win a Date with a Nobel Laureate contest. And here's Karen Hopkin to tell us about our laureate. Thank you, my silver-filled whoopie pie. Tonight, we have a real treat for you. Our Win a Date prize is a charmer called Lou. Louis Ignaro won the 1998 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. His stimulating studies on nitric oxide and its effects on erectile function in rabbits <laughs> almost single-handedly gave rise to the development of Viagra. A native of Brooklyn, this cuddly little bundle of pluck knows how to handle a stickball bat. Lou enjoys fun in the sun and other places. He's a master of N.O., but if you take Lou home tonight, <laughs> oh, please give a warm win -a day welcome to Lou Ignaro. All right. Let's see who will win a date with this Nobel laureate. When you entered the hall tonight, you were handed an attractive printed program. Please pick it up, open it, and look through it. If your program contains a picture of Professor Lipscomb making a cup of tea, then you've won a date with this Nobel laureate. Come on down and collect your prize.
luck, kids. <laughs> the Peace Prize, the Ig Nobel Peace Prize this year is awarded to Arturis Zouakis, the mayor of Vilnius, Lithuania, for <laughs> demonstrating that the problem of illegally parked luxury cars can be solved by running them over with an armored tank. Here is a, here's a brief video explaining the phenomenon. Please welcome Mayor Zoakis. Thank you. It seems that they have discovered what unites people around the globe, and this universally understood that an idiot blocking a bike lane is the same idiot no matter where he lives and what language he speaks. <laughs> if we finally solve the problems of illegal parking, the world for sure will be a better place with peace and harmony, and I'm glad to have to do my part in it. Mark Twain said, the human race has only one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. And on the end, I would like to give a special book as a gift. It's called Illegal Living. It's published in Lithuania. And of course, it's not a handbook how to become illegal. And uh, very useful stickers. If you will have problems, for example, your, your neighbor will park your, will block your entrance. It will be very useful. And thank you very much for this award. The Public Safety Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Public Safety is awarded to John Senders of the University of Toronto, Canada for conducting a series of safety experiments in which a person drives an automobile on a major highway while a visor repeatedly flaps down over his face, blinding him. <laughs> Here's a brief video documenting the experiment. And I'm trying to get this of the demand I got by this particular section of road. The speed of the car is constant, and as the road varies from moment to moment in the demand that it makes upon me, I must look more often or less often, as the case may be. Please welcome John Sanders. Thank you. In 1963, I was asked to investigate normal driving. Everyone was looking at accidents and things like that. And Don Gordon at the Bureau of Public Roads said if I knew anything about normal driving, he'd love to hear about it. So, on the highways round old Cambridge goes the car of old John Sanders, daring scientist. Old John Sanders drives with eyes closed half the time. Then he built a driving helmet. On command, his sight occluded. Others thought he was deluded. Drives with eyes closed half the time. In accord with expectations, found robust correlations. Wider roads, 
slower speeds, far, far fewer looks he needs. Then came cell phones, then came texting, then came deaths and lawsuits vexing. Now, to quantify distraction, my technique gives satisfaction. Forty years after the publication, my occlusion method became an international standard. Thank you. Before we finish up the, uh, the evening with the triumphal handshaking of the winners and then the stirring grand finale of the opera, we remind you to join us this Saturday afternoon at MIT. The new winners and the returning winners, some of them, will give free public talks to explain, if they can, what they did and why they did it. Uh, that will be this Saturday, 1 p.m., MIT, room 26100. That's a different room from our usual. So room 26100 at MIT, 1 p.m., and it's free. Uh, now, before we finish up the evening with the conclusion to the opera, it's time for the triumphal handshaking with Nobel laureate Roy Glauber. All the new Nobel Prize winners will now emerge, one by one, through the sacred curtain, there to receive a token handshake from Nobel laureate Roy Glauber. Let the emerging and the shaking begin. Final acts of our mini opera, Chemist in a Coffee Shop. Our singers and musicians will be joined by the Nobel laureates and the other distinguished scientists that you see here on our stage. Here's our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Oh, I'm back. Thank you, my superoxide-infused snickerdoodle. Uh, I'm just in time for the thrilling conclusion to tonight's opera. Oh, look. The coffee shop is filled with customers, and they look excited. That's because the baristas have just invented a new flavor of coffee. Everyone's about to have their very first sip. Let's see if it's good.
interesting. There's no need to take notes because now we sell boxes of this coffee in stores everywhere. Isn't this a beautiful box of coffee? <laughs> and all the ingredients are listed on the box. <laughs> And helium and happium and herbarium and water and strontium and fluorine and turbium and manganese and mercury molybdenum magnesium and prosium and tantalum and cerium and cesium and lead and titanium and platinum plutonium and palladium vanadium potassium plutonium and tantalum technetium titanium tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium David Stockton. David. And now, Professor Jean Burko Gleason will deliver the traditional Ig Nobel goodbye, goodbye speech. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let us honor all of the many people who put this ceremony together. They're behind you and over there and there and through here. There, there are a lot of them. Please. Now, would the Ig Nobel Prize winners and the Nobel laureates Please gather here at center stage. Stay here if you are here. Um, gather here at center stage for a pointless photo opportunity. <laughs> All together. Hastily, hastily. Step up. Up, 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 up to the front where people can see you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please whack your hands together and shower them with self-esteem. On behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association and the Harvard Radcliffe Society of Physics Students, and on behalf of the Harvard Computer Society, especially from all of us at the Annals of Improbable Research, please remember this final thought. If you didn't win an Ig Nobel Prize tonight, and especially if you did, better luck next year. Thank you.